Well, um, from our uh, program, there have been a number of uh, presentations at this year's meeting. Um, and the clinical side, um, probably our uh, two most uh, important presentations have been um, in the context of bortezomib-based therapies in uh, relapsed and refractory myeloma. Uh, the first uh, one is the combination of tenaspamycin, uh, a novel heat shock protein 90 inhibitor combined with bortezomib in a large phase 1-2 trial of patients with relapsed refractory myeloma. And um, the results of this study show um, the activity of this combination in patients um, with advanced disease, multiple lines of prior therapy. And very importantly, um, we do have uh, responses in patients who are refractory to bortezomib alone, um, then who do appear to respond to the combination. And the rationale behind the study is that HSP90 inhibition uh, is an important uh, therapeutic target um, for us in myeloma, particularly in patients being exposed to bortezomib, because one of the mechanisms of bortezomib resistance, we believe, is through the upregulation of HSP90. And in our research, we found, which was an unexpected but very encouraging finding, um, was that in fact there may be um, neuroprotection from the use of tenaspamycin with bortezomib, because uh, as you may know, bortezomib's most important toxicity, arguably, is peripheral neuropathy. Um, it's dose limiting and it occurs in about at least a third of patients to some degree, and um, possibly more. Um, in lower, lower grades, so it's a significant uh, issue. And what we found is that um, with the use of tenaspamycin and the interference with HSP90, downstream there is actually an upregulation of HSP70 uh, as part of the heat shock protein cascade. And what's very interesting is that HSP70 is actually a neuroprotectant. And in the clinical trial, we observed that we actually had in 72 patients no grade 3 peripheral neuropathy and our overall rate of grade 1 and 2 peripheral neuropathy was surprisingly low at, at actually just 20%. Um, whereas I would say in the similar population, it would be expected to be at least a third, if not actually significantly more, almost a half, one would argue. About 40% is what we see in the relapsed refractory population. So in that context, we're encouraged. Um, the, important message in the, in, the, in the presentation, though, is that we have taken this observation back to the laboratory and in a rodent model of neuropathy demonstrated that um, bortezomib plus tenaspamycin does not induce the same neurotoxicity in this rat model that we see with bortezomib alone. And then in this model, when we give bortezomib alone, we see clearly neurotoxicity in the rat. But then when we give tenaspamycin, that neurotoxicity improves. So we have a quite a nice experience in a preclinical model recognizing all the caveats that exist there to suggest that this phenomenon is real. So coupled with that favorable toxicity profile plus this evidence that there may be activity um, even in patients uh, who are resistant to bortezomib, we're going forward in a phase three randomized trial to compare bortezomib-based therapy versus bortezomib-based therapy plus tenaspamycin to see if this is, 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 is something that really does help patients and obviously confirm um, this phase one, two experience. So this is one presentation. The other clinical presentation that uh, uh, may be of, of interest is the uh, updated results in our relapsed refractory study um, of the combination of lenalidomide with bortezomib and dexamethasone, the so-called RVD uh, platform. And in our phase one study of this combination, we showed that this combination was particularly well tolerated and active, even in patients who were resistant, whose disease had progressed on prior imid-based therapy or proteasome inhibitors. And so this particular trial was, again, a large multicenter effort, um, 65 patients strong, basically looking at the activity of the three drugs, bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone combined, in patients with advanced myeloma. And as a phase two experience, we were very pleased to report that it confirmed the findings we saw in phase one with a robust response rate um, with minimal responses or better in this population of 84%, which is quite striking, and a PR rate, partial response rate or better, uh, in excess of 60%. So we're very, or, or around 60%. So we're very encouraged by that and feel that that's a very uh, a positive finding. And what's very interesting is that these responses appear to be durable and they seem to occur independent of risk. In other words, patients with adverse cytogenetics or other features of bad biology respond as well as those patients who do not appear to have the same um, adverse risk profile. And that's very important for us because obviously if this regimen is able to provide therapeutic capture for 
you know, patients even with poor risk features versus what we call standard risk, because obviously myeloma is challenging for everyone. Um, this is encouraging, particularly if it's well tolerated. But the one word of caution is that when you look at risk profiling, it's very important not just to look at response rates, but to look at time to event analysis. And that obviously is still cooking. So, um, you know, we have to take a pinch of salt there and say, well, we'll see. But certainly the preliminary results are encouraging, and we feel that this platform of lenalidomide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone is showing great promise both in relapsed refractory disease as well now as in the upfront setting. Yeah, well, I think in myeloma, there are a number of important presentations um, by colleagues. And I think that uh, in, in what particularly struck me in, in, in this last, uh, in yesterday's sessions in the upfront setting, um, were a number of, I think, key presentations. Uh, one by Dr. Antonio Palombo and the Jemima study group, I think, is very helpful. It was a comparison of bortezomib, melphalan, and prednisone versus bortezomib, melphalan, prednisone, and thalidomide in older patients. And um, what was very interesting was that the response rates were higher for the four-drug regimen, but the actual progression-free survival and overall survival data were actually very similar. And what was particularly interesting was, again, this peripheral neuropathy, which is a challenge both for bortezomib and thalidomide, um, was a problem in the older population, not unexpectedly. And um, in fact, what really helped reduce the toxicity in older patients was making the bortezomib weekly, um, which I think is, 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 is something we've known for some time, that dose reduction and schedule change with bortezomib can reduce its neurotoxicity. The key challenge, of course, is maintaining its efficacy. This is a very active drug. And so in order to you know, keep the sort of 600-pound gorilla under control, which is the myeloma, you have to give the drug often enough, but you also at the same time don't want to do so at the cost of unacceptable toxicity. So this idea that you can become weakly in an older patient and reduce neurotoxicity I think is a very important uh, uh, point. Uh, I think the key issue is in combination, you can probably afford to do that. Uh, and what you could perhaps reasonably construct is that you could treat on the twice-weekly schedule initially, achieve a response quickly, and then move rapidly to a weekly schedule to maintain that response. And I think, in fairness, there were a number of presentations by other investigators that were similarly uh, intriguing. Uh, in the upfront setting, there were a number of studies showing that the combinations of various drugs are important and may, in fact, enhance the depth and quality of response. One of those, in particular, was um, from my colleague, uh, Dr. Andres Jakubowiak from the University of Michigan, in which, uh, as part of a multi-centers trial um, supported by the Multiple Myeloma Research Consortium, um, we looked at the backbone of RVD, which I already alluded to, with the addition of liposomal doxorubicin. Now, we know that anthracyclines, in the absence of bortezomib, aren't particularly active in myeloma clinically. Um, and preclinically, there's a very strong rationale for the combination. And Dr. Robert Orlowski and his team have shown and actually taken as far as FDA approval that the combination of bortezomib and liposomal doxorubicin is a very effective combination. This is building on that, but bringing it into the upfront setting. And what Andras Jakubowiak has done is used the RVD platform and added the liposomal doxorubicin to it on the hypothesis that the bortezomib and the liposomal doxorubicin, we believe, have important synergies. Uh, and also there is evidence that lenalidomide may enhance that as well. So the idea is to build on that. And what Andres showed, I think, very nicely is a very high response rate commensurate with what we've seen with the RVD platform itself. And the key question becomes then, what is the depth, quality, and durability of those responses? Um, but Andres's phase one, two study, very elegantly done, basically establishing the maximum tolerated doses and now moving into phase two with very encouraging response rates and manageable side effects. Um, my own impression of this combination is that it is very active. I think the key thing with all of these four drug combinations is whether or not the toxicity of the fourth drug you know, is, is manageable, acceptable, and makes a difference that's to the benefit of the patient. Because what we are recognizing, and the discussant of this session, Dr. Vince Rajkumar, I think did a very good job of saying, well, let's be careful because before we go to four or five drug regimens, we have to be sure that two versus three is real, which we are doing in randomized trials. And I think most of us in the field feel that's probably so. The big question is four versus three. You know, if you add that fourth drug, be it an alkylator such as cyclophosphamide or liposomal doxorubicin or a another, the question really is how much does that add? And the reason I think that's very important is because we're learning that side effects really matter. I mean, we've always felt that, but they really matter because the longer you can stay on treatment, the better the outcome. 
And the question really then becomes, if you're on treatments that are potentially toxic, that of course shuts down your ability to safely and reasonably dose patients. And so there are a number of challenges we face that will need to be answered in the context of uh, prospective studies that are, that are now ongoing.